This conference will now be recorded. Yeah, okay, thank you, Professor Shea. Uh, food from Food Safety and Food Security uh, Social Sm Science Small, Small Working Group One Health Commission. Um, today we are celebrating together the World Safety uh, World Food Safety Day uh, with uh, Dr. Bilal, Dr. Sadek, and Professor Caesar. Uh, we will start our webinar after three minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Bilal if you can share your screen. Please, if you sorry, Rango, can, just let to, me know. Thanks to share it. I'm not familiar yeah. with the with the Google. Hear... Google. Yes. So, can you share your screen, Professor the Doctor? Uh, no, I can't. I I'm not familiar with this uh, this application. Uh, can you share it? Yes. Just a moment. Yeah. Um, okay, you know that the network is too slow here. Hello, Randa, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello, Professor Caesar. Hello, Professor Dr. Bilal. And also, please, Hello. Dr. Sadr, please unmute yourself and welcome your uh, uh, your attendee to our meeting today. Um, before anything, happy fifth uh, word today. Uh, Hello, Dr. Randa. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you look awesome, Dr. Bilal. Could you please unmute yourself and uh, uh, show uh, if you can uh, also yes, turn on yes. your camera, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm unmuted now, but I can't uh, share my screen uh, right now. Uh, uh, happy to uh, to share with you in this uh, yeah, I... in this webinar. Uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Caesar, Professor Caesar, Dr. Sade, uh, Randa, and uh, and all the attendees. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet uh, all of you. Uh, also, it's our pleasure to meet you, Doctor. Uh, since uh, our our uh, our attendee are familiar with our small group, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Bilal, can you please just introduce yourself to the attendee um, meanwhile i'm going to share my screen to to show your presentation mm -hmm. okay. okay uh i am uh, bilal abdel fatah i'm from egypt uh, 13 years uh, of experience in quality and food safety in uh, saudi arabia and in egypt uh, in food production uh, americana and uh, johanna uh, meat production poultry uh, processed the uh, uh, production and uh, juice and milk uh, production uh, and in uh, Majid Futaim Carrefour uh, uh, in retail industry I was uh, I am now responsible for uh, quality manager position in uh, retail uh, and e-commerce right now uh, thank you so much Dr. Bilal um, I'm gonna share your Yes, I'm going to share your presentation. Uh, please just give me a few moments because uh, it's taking some time. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, so. <laughs> Well, Dr. Bilal, it's your first time with us. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I guess we are a group of veterinarians. Professor Caesar, he's also yeah. a veterinarian. And uh, Dr. Bilal, he's a veterinarian. And Dr. Sadek, so happy yes. veterinarians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Honored to you. meet with you. Uh oh, I don't know, it's taking a lot of time.
Okay, please, if you can sh see my screen, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Seems to be in process now. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask the audience, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, because uh, to hear our uh, our presenter, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my camera, please. Uh, I'm trying to share, uh, Randa. Is it uh, appearing now? My screen appearing now? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, you are you are the presenter, and also yeah. after that, Dr. Sadek and Professor Caesar. So you can share your okay. screen. I'm I sh I'm sharing this uh, now. Uh, can you see it now? Can you see anything? I can't see anything. Oh, I can see it. Yes, yes, we, yes. We, we can see. We, yeah. we can see. Great, Just great. maybe put in the yes. presentation mode. Yeah. 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 Is it good now? Uh, yeah. Yes. Please just make it a full screen. Yeah. Great. Is it good now? Uh, so they, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I will, please. Okay. Need... Can you start? Yes, please. Uh -huh. uh, firstly, uh, welcome to all of uh, attendees. Uh, uh, thank you, Randa, for uh, this opportunity uh, to make me present my uh, my knowledge with you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Caesar, uh, Dr. Sade, and uh, attendees. Uh, nice to meet uh, all of you. I will start uh, right now. Uh, uh, happy uh, World Food Safety Day. Uh, uh, the, 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 big, the biggest challenge to us who are working in uh, food safety uh, field, culture, culture of uh, people in uh, the field and customers. Sometimes customers doesn't know uh, what's uh, right and wrong. But we can start, or we, we must start with uh, the worker in the field, uh, doctors, uh, our college doctors, and uh, and uh, other uh, other workers. Uh, my presentation is talking about uh, food safety culture in supply chain. We will uh, know uh, stages of food supply chain. Uh, then we will know how why uh, food safety culture in supply chain matters. Then we will know how to create a strong food safety culture uh, uh, in steps. Stages of food supply chain, we are starting with raw material. Raw material, it uh, uh, might be, uh, we are talking about meat, we are talking about uh, fruits and vegetables. Everything have a start. The start of, uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables by agriculture, the start of the, uh, the start of meat by raising livestock. By raising uh, livestock. Uh, then the second stage is supplier uh, uh, handling and storage. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the the this stage is a transition stage be between the first the, the start and the processing stage then processing then distribution of uh, the product then uh, re uh, retailing then consumption am i clear uh, right now uh, am i clear at all? um 
I will not moving. It seems to me, doctor, that the presentation is not moving. Uh, even one of the attendee, he was trying just to inform us that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, now it's moving. Yeah. Yeah. Is it good Thank now? You. It is not in full. It is not in full. It is more PPT mode. It is not in PPT mode. I can't hear you. Okay. Can you please just write down in the chat box if you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, I guess it's Mr. Muhammad, maybe. So, uh, can you please, sir, just um, ma make your you make your presentation um, in full yeah. screen mode? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you please try that one more time? Okay. Is it clear now? Uh, can you please just move this move move the slides? I'm moving it now. Yeah, actually, nothing is moving from my, uh, as I see from my side. Uh, you can just nothing close. Moves. Yeah, you can just close the window and uh, reopen it. Okay. Thank you. I don't know who's trying to speak here. <laughs> uh, are you? Uh, Is it good now, Rando? Uh, let's wait a few seconds because we can't okay. see anything. Okay. Uh, hello, Rando. Hello, Dr. Sadiq. Yes, yes, it's Dr. Sadiq. I will suggest that I or Dr. Uh, or Professor Caesar should continue with the presentation so that we respect the time. Uh, and no, we can wait for a few minutes. Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you. Is it clear now? Yes, it's clear. It's moving, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, try thank moving, thank try you. moving the slide so that we can... Yeah, yeah, try uh, sorry for the disturbance. We'll uh, continue from here. Uh, but it's not the moving. Slides, yeah, it's... Oh, the slides are not moving. Yeah, oh, now they are moving. moving now. Yeah. Yeah, moving, yeah? Thank, yeah? You. yeah. thank you, thank, thank you. you. Sorry for disturbance. Okay. Uh, we will start with the first step of the, or, or first stage of the food supply chain. First stage uh, when uh, food uh, grown or developed, as, as we said, uh, that we have uh, crops fruits and vegetables and we have livestock it takes place in animal farms and crop farms and fisheries products coming from this stage are fruits vegetables grains and uh, livestock they must follow local and international standards of food safety and quality the second step handling and storage is uh, it is a transition stage between production and processing we can't uh, uh, make the uh, take take the cow and process for uh, uh, meat cuts, we have to, we had to have we have to have a, a slaughterhouse. We have to have mills for for grains to be transformed to uh, uh, weight uh, and other uh, products, so we can process them. This refers to pre preparation uh, uh, and last minute steps that food undergoes once the production stage ended. This step will occur before food sent to be processed. The processing, converting foods from being plants or animal into an edible form, uh, uh, changing grain to be uh, wheat, changing animal to be meat, milk, to be uh, Then the stage of distribution, distributing the uh, product. Uh, uh, we have farms, we have uh, processing plants, we have mills, but they have to serve all the world or all the, the uh, cities in, in the, the country. So distribution is a very important step. Once the food is edible, distributed to to a retail or supplier, food must be protected during transport. All we we, we all know that uh, uh, some products uh, need uh, to be chilled, uh, temperature from zero uh, to four uh, Celsius. Some products need to be frozen, minus 18. Uh, 
uh, minus uh, uh, 18 uh, degrees uh, under under zero. Uh, uh, so we, we we have to respect these uh, these rules, not to have uh, food uh, damage. Good communication between shipper and manufacturer and transporter and receiver of food stuff is essential. We have all uh, have uh, the contracts and the uh, 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 agreements to have this uh, distribution uh, mean, uh, mean uh, to be uh, to be respected. Retailing is the process used to deliver products from supplier to consumer and involve everything from obtaining food to selling it, uh, just like uh, hypermarkets and supermarkets. Consumption, this takes place once customer purchases the food from retail. Any question uh, till now? Okay. So we will uh, uh, move to... Yeah. Yeah, pardon me, Dr. Bilal. Uh, yeah. We will have a session for... Um, um, for an open session for the questions from the uh, from the attendees. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. please feel free in presenting your presentation. Thank okay, you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so the second chapter, why food safety culture in supply chain matters. All these steps, all these steps of uh, uh, supply chain must be uh, included in uh, food safety culture. Strong food safety culture will result in brand integrity. So we, we when you see a brand, uh, Nestle, uh, Mars, Pepsi, you have the trust uh, in it. If if they have the food safety culture, then customer loyalty, the customer will be loyal to your product if you have uh, a quality and food safety level is respected. Supply chain stability, so uh, we will uh, explain this, and boosting profits. Brand integrity, Food safety culture inside uh, an organization of uh, food supply chain will cause good quality and food safety level. The, the, uh, uh, the brand or the organization who respects food safety, it will uh, uh, impact on the quality of food safety and quality level and uh, low incidence of food safety and quality. So it will be reflected on their, uh, on their brand. Good quality and food safety level will reflect in the name of brand, uh, so uh, when you see uh, uh, a brand of Nestle and PepsiCo, so you are, so you are uh, uh, have the trust in this uh, brand. The second thing, customer loyalty. Food safety is the, when you, when you uh, uh, listen or, or when you hear about uh, a food safety incident, you you lose the trust uh, in uh, the supply chain and the. Uh, brand and the organization you are dealing with. The customer of uh, in the supply chain, not only the consumer, not only the last uh, stage, the consumer is the last stage. Uh, uh, the processing plant, customer to production organization and retail is a customer to uh, the processing and so on. Supply chain stability when uh, we have food safety culture so we have good quality and food safety levels so we have lo very low uh, incidence of food safety and the quality so supply chain will be intact and not uh, disrupted uh, once one food safety incident as, as we say in any stage of supply chain might cause broken food supply chain broken food supply chain will cause uh, disruption all stages it will will uh, stop the the chain so Will lead to financial instability and financial losses. Boosting profits, practicing uh, a strong food safety culture, mean ensuring high standard of uh, food safety uh, and quality. If you deliver best food, your customer base will automatically increase. When I trust uh, uh, Nestle, when I trust uh, uh, Carrefour, when I trust uh, any brand, so I will uh, uh, deal with them all the time. And I will talk to everybody about them, so uh, more customers, so more profits. More and more, people will prefer buying from you, meaning that you will make sales and greater uh, profits. The last uh, chapter, how to create a strong food safety culture. It's uh, uh, have five fundamentals, equality, accountability, encouragement, 
teamwork and training. Equality, it means that I am a, a, a quality and food safety manager that uh, if uh, uh, even a CEO of the company, when he enters the, the factory, he have uh, uh, to respect food safety rules. He have to uh, hair, uh, uh, wear the hairnet. He have to wash his hands. When uh, a worker uh, inside uh, the factory sees that the, the, the most senior level in his company respects the rules, so he will respect the rule. If he doesn't see him respecting the rule, he will have doubts. We will have doubts in uh, uh, these rules. Food safety rules are more likely to be practiced by all employees if the senior management practice them. Doing so will highlight the leadership, commitment to food safety, promote strong sense of adherence, and compliance in both new and old employees. All employees will uh, uh, respect the rules uh, by heart, uh, if, we, if we can say. Accountability, uh, if we say, or if we tell everybody to respect uh, uh, rules uh, without uh, feeling that uh, they, they will be consequences if they, uh, if they uh, don't uh, go to uh, with rules, uh, so you can't have a food safety culture. Accountability uh, is a major element to, to robust uh, uh, food safety culture and food quality. Uh, 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 often penalize any member who do not follow code of conduct. The organization must publish a penalty policy for violation related to food safety. Whoever make a mistake will be banished. If we uh, make uh, it clear, it will reflect on uh, the food safety culture. Encouragement, uh, the, the accountability uh, reverse uh, encouragement. Uh, we have to uh, uh, embed in, in, in employees that whoever will uh, comply with, uh, uh, with our rules will be rewarded. If you want everyone in your or food business to practice all rules, you must encourage and reward them. Okay, teamwork. Food safety culture make your employees more aware that what's good for your business and customers. This is in turn brings about collective effort from the entire team to boost profits by maintaining high food safety standards. We have to make all employees or, or all uh, uh, workers uh, in our organization believe that uh, he has a, a, a very important role in the food safety culture. Training. Uh, uh, of course, training is, is the, one of the uh, most important things. Uh, it must be regular and must be updated. Must it um, it makes uh, uh, our workers feel uh, that they are appreciated. They are in track uh, with us. Thank you. Uh, sorry for any disturbance. Thank you, Randa. Thank uh, thanks for all attendees. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bilal. Actually, it's my first time to know how much uh, the food supply chain, chain is related to food safety and food culture. Uh, thank you so much for your nice presentation. Um, you. You're welcome, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, we will uh, we will have an open session after the end after closing the web after I'm sorry after the last. A presentation uh, for any for any question from the attendee to the speakers. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bilal. And now we will move on, and and uh, we will ask Dr. Uh, Professor Caesar. Professor Caesar is one of our uh, previous uh, presenters, uh, and also he's a team member in the One Health. Uh, Food safety, food security, social sciences, uh, small working group. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Dr. Caesar, uh, feel free. And I will mute myself. Thank you. Okay. Let me, I'm not, um, hi, Rhonda. Um, I'm not really familiarized with this platform, but I, I will try. I hope I won't have any problem. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, if you wish, okay. yeah, yeah. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure, I will. But um, can you please confirm that um, you are seeing my my?
my screen, yes. my full screen. Yes, yes, we can All right. see it. Okay, great. Uh, let me pick up this. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank Randa again uh, for being the leader of this um, small working group, the One Health Social Sciences, Food Safety and Food Security. Uh, congratulations, because you are the ones that are moving this really enthusiastic group. I'm sorry that sometimes I couldn't answer all the information, all the messages in the WhatsApp group, but congratulations, con uh, congratulations for being the, the, the real leader for, for this area of the food oh, safety. Uh, I, <laughs> and, I, I, <laughs> sorry. I feel shy. No, 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 no. This is the truth. This is the truth. I can see that. And thanks for all the organizers and in the group that are with, with you. And thank you for all the attendees also that are taking your time for this wonderful celebration day in the world's uh, food safety. Uh, well, my name is Cesar Gavidia. I'm a professor, a principal professor in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos, which is uh, located in Lima, in Peru, um, the oldest university, by the way, in, in the Americas. Um, I'm currently the director of the graduate office in, in the same School of Veterinary Medicine. But um, my principal appointment is in epidemiology, veterinary epidemiology. I'm a veterinarian and I work in veterinary epidemiology, particularly with some zoonotic uh, diseases. I work in public health. So my expertise, my main expertise uh, is in, in zoonotic diseases, in infectious diseases, uh, mainly parasites, a few parasites that are still, unfortunately, to say in that way, are very prevalent, not only in countries like Peru, but in many other regions, developing countries all over the world. I said, unfortunately, because time is passing and still we have to lead with uh, diseases like the ones I want, uh, I, I'm going to present to you this uh, afternoon here. Uh, I guess it's night in other parts of the, of the world. So my main topic today, I hope to be a little bit short, it's going to be about this parasite, probably some of you already recognize it, Echinococcus granulosus, as a, one of the several parasites that can be transmitted by, by food or water. It's a foodborne parasitic infection. As I said, it's very still highly, very high prevalent in many areas, and in Peru is in the, in the central and south highlands. This is just to show you where, where is Peru, probably you already know, um, Peru is in the in this in South America. We have the different regions, um, the coast, which is uh, the Pacific Ocean. Then we have the Andean Mountains that divides the, our country in between the coast, the highlands, and the the jungle, the other part of the of the country that have uh, Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, Bolivia, and Chile as a uh, border countries around around us. And this disease is very prevalent in this area of our country. Not only, but it's highly prevalent in the central and also in the south of the, of the highlands. Popular cities like Cusco, probably because of Machu Picchu, that's the area. I don't want to scare you, but this is the area that we have Echinococcus granulosus. Probably you, you already know about this important uh, ranking of the infectious diseases that can be transmitted by, by food or water. And in this ranking, still we see as number one, tinea solium, this is another parasite that we, we also have in the same areas. And the two most important species of Echinococcus, Echinococcus granulosus and Echinococcus multilocularis. Thanks God we have only Echinococcus granulosus and Echinococcus bogeli, which is another one in, in our country. But areas of countries like um, in Asia, like China, have both of them. But I want to point out, I want to take your attention that among the different uh, diseases that can be transmitted by, by food, tinea solium and kinococcus granulosus are in the, the first two, two tops. This is what happened not only in Peru, as I said, but probably in many other countries, like um, the, the raising 
uh, livestock in general, but particularly sheep, along with uh, dogs as a pet, pet uh, wards, and also people around, are the particular conditions uh, that for the parasite to survive. It's like uh, the parasite already knows um, what to do with the, this, these three different is a animal species in order to survive and remain um, as a problem for for so many years. No? This, is, this is not a new disease. This is a very old disease um, in in different countries in, in the world. And still so many countries trying to control, trying to prevent and eliminate the parasite. And we are struggling. We are fighting against the parasite for decades even for centuries in some areas in the, in the planet. This is another particular condition for, for this parasite. This is a close contact that we have kids with, with dogs and probably to get the infection at early ages. The problem becomes when people is adult or, or, or young, but the, the infection comes at, this, at these ages. And so they are in high risk to get, the, to get infected by the close contact with the with the dogs. And of course, it, it happens in rural areas. There is no probably water, there are no soap, there's no hygiene, sanitation, etc. For you know all, all the characteristics for the rural areas. And they also they, they have always not only one, two dogs, probably three or four or five, because the dogs take care of the of the animals. But the kids are in close contact. They don't wash the hands before eating, or probably the contamination is in all the environment, so at the time they consume vegetables or water, they are, they can be infected with the with the parasite. Just a, a cute picture, of course. This is a very nice picture from uh, from the highlands. Uh, nice girls, and you can see this this contact with the with the dog, which is the definitive host of the parasite. Briefly, uh, just to remind you, probably for those who already know about parasites. Uh, the life, the life cycle of the Kinococcus handulosus is the adult stage is a small tinea living in the small intestine of, of dogs. In general, it could be foxes or or wolves, but uh, the domestic dog is the the most important in the life in the in the life cycle of uh, of the parasite. So, X proglottids, gravid proglottids can go to Uh, maybe Dr. Professor Caesar is facing some technical issues. Um, uh, please uh, uh, bear with us a few seconds till he come back. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can share a few things about our small working group till uh, Professor Caesar rejoin us. Um, uh, we are a small working group. Uh, we are the food safety, food security small working group, uh, so, uh, uh, social sciences. Uh, it's part of One Health Commission uh, small working groups. Oh my God. Um, we do a lot of activities related to food safety and food security, uh, such as webinars. We have conducted a study related to, to One Health, uh, food safety and food security under One Health umbrella. Um, also, uh, we would like the others to, to know more about us. Uh, please join our WhatsApp group. I will share the link via the chat box. Um, Oh. 
Also, I'm going to sh share the link of the attendance in case the any of the attendee would like to have a, uh, to get a certificate uh, of a, uh, for attending today's webinar. Um, maybe Dr. Sadiq, you can move on. Tell Dr. Siza re rejoin us. What do you think? Because even he he's maybe. Okay, Randa. Okay, he's back. He's back. Uh, he's back. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, please, Dr. Caesar, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now, Randa? Uh, yes, yes, Professor. Can you hear we me? can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, what happened? I, I guess I, I, my internet failed, right? Yeah. Uh, we have. Oh, uh, sorry. Please, can you, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Not this one. This yes. one? Uh, no, no, no. The previous one. Yeah. Here. Thank you. Oh, you didn't hear about the life cycle? No. Yes, can you oh. please just repeat that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's technology failing here. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't hear anything about the life cycle? Oh, my no. God. It, okay. Yeah, it was a story. Okay. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No, no, no problem. And, and this is an important, an important part because um, yeah. I was trying to explain briefly what happened with the, with this parasite. I mean, the adult tinea live in the small intestine of dogs, domestic dogs, and they release with the feces, they release eggs or even gravid proglottis or sometimes even the, the whole parasite in the feces. In any way, the, the contamination in the environment is, is heavy. Um, water, pasture, vegetables in general can be contaminated with eggs of this echinococcus granulosus. Uh, the intermediate host is, could be sheep, cattle, uh, horses, uh, llamas, alpacas in Peru, uh, all the animals can be intermediate hosts, herbivores in general. And each one of these um, eggs of the parasite, the adult parasite, can develop into a cyst, particularly in liver and lungs. Could be in any organ, any part of the, of the body of the animal. But for some reason, parasite, this parasite likes, love um, lungs and livers. Also, after a few months or even years, because the, the growing is, is very slow, you can see cysts, I'm going to show you some pictures later, cysts containing hundreds or thousands of parasites, the larval stage of the parasite, which is this one. And the life cycle is, is closed because the people in, the, in, the, in these areas, because of the lack of knowledge of the parasite cycle, of course, they feed the, the dogs uh, intentionally as a reward, for instance, as a reward of, uh, for, the, for the dogs or make the dogs more uh, brave to take care of the, of the, of the flock. Uh, so finally, they, they feed the animals or the dogs find a way to eat this raw viscera and each one of these parasites can get into a new tinea in the, in the definitive host, which is the dog. And you can imagine if, if, if a cyst contain 10,000 proteoscoliasis, each one of these could could be a new tinea in in the dogs. In dogs, um, humans can get the infection exactly the same as a sheep, for instance, uh, by the close contact with with dogs, with their dogs, infected dogs, or by eating probably vegetables or water contaminated with the eggs. And exactly the same process, uh, cysts can develop uh, into cysts, particularly mainly in in lungs or livers, but there you could find reports of cystic echinococcosis in different parts of, uh, of the body, uh, starting from brain, heart, kidney, spleen, ovary, uh, muscle, bone, everywhere. And I, uh, here I was showing you just um, a picture of the parasite, very small tinea, half a centimeter with the scolex and the three or four proglottids. 
and here the larval stage. This is what I was trying to show you. But as I said, each one of the seas contain several hundreds or several thousands of uh, larval stage of the of Canococcus granulosus. So you you can estimate the potential of surviving of the burden of the infection, which is in the environment. If we think in food, well, you can imagine a lettuce or a tomato or another um, vegetable infected with, with this parasite. This is um, how can, you can see the, um, the lungs of heavy, heavily infected sheep in the, in, the, in the central highlands here in Peru. Uh, you can see so many seas in the in the lung in this area. I hope you can see my my pointer, and also in the liver. Almost all the organs are invaded by by, by seas. And as I said, each one of these can contain several thousands of proteoscolices, the larval stage, and each one potentially can can be transformed into a new tinea in in dogs. Here you have another one, and the same picture you can find in, in humans, although because of the humans have the, the contact with dogs, uh, not too many seas like this, like, like this, you could see in humans probably one, two or three, but what you can see in, in persons is several multiple infections during the whole life. And just another picture of uh, lungs infected with um, with cystic echinococcosis, here you have another one huh, in, in, in the lungs. So what happened with, um, I, I'm, I'm putting this picture not uh, to offer you this uh, delicious uh, liver that is, is very common to, to eat here in Peru. But when, when you have this infection in livers and lungs, people lose uh, the income. Normally, they, they sell the liver, the lungs, the head, the, the legs of the animal as a whole. But when you have the seeds in, the, in these organs, they have to throw it away. If they use, if in any case, which is not very common, they use an official slaughterhouse, it will be confiscated. So they, they lose the money, the, the supposed money that they will, they will earn. Um, but not only that. Is, and also you have I have another one here. This is lung. Uh, this is another dish, a Peruvian dish. But not only is the the money that they they don't earn, but also this is a, a source of protein for for many people that are are poor in these areas. So losing the liver, losing the lungs of infected from infected animals means not only losing money, but also losing an opportunity. For, for animal protein in these kind of communities. So what happens if some of us, oh, I hope no, I, I wouldn't say in that way. <laughs> what happens is some people get uh, infected with, with eggs, exactly the same seas. You can see the, the whole, several seas in the cavity, the abdominal cavity. You have another one, almost half of the lungs, the left side of the, of the lung. You have another one here. This one, which is in the in the left with a red arrow, is almost the same size of the of the heart. If you have an, an estimation there, so you can imagine what what could happen. I don't want to talk about these clinical symptoms now in this presentation, but you you could imagine what would happen with people having seas like this in the lung or in the liver. This one. We found this one in the, in the Central Highlands, not, not the, the top images, the, the bottom ones, the ultrasound. This seas measured 15 centimeters in diameter. So it's pretty big to have that in, in liver. And these people need surgery or long treatment with albendazole or the combination or both. But not only that, after recovering, probably they, they will, because they live in the same uh, environment, they are continue being in risk to get the infection. They will probably, after two or three or four years, they will get another infection and they have another disease and another disease. I met a, a person there in the Highlands that had, had been operated twice on the right and the left side of the lungs. And then they have, he, he had another disease 
in the liver, but they don't, uh, he does, that didn't have money to go to a hospital to be operated again. So this is the, the life of these people in the, in the poor communities. So where is Echinococcus granulosus in the world? You can imagine this, um, it's everywhere. Uh, more than a more than hundred countries have reported cystic echinococcosis. Um, although this is a pretty, pretty old map, 2011, but more than 100 countries have cystic echinococcosis. The red, uh, the more intense red ones, like Peru here, half of the country, are the ones that have more, more parasites. Uh, this is not real, uh, I mean, this is not a real image of the what is happening, for instance, in South America, because Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile have already implemented control program more than 50 years ago, and they are doing pretty well. It takes a lot of time to control the disease, but you can see countries in Africa, in Asia, and even in Europe, we have cystic echinococcosis. And in, in developed nations, like in North America and probably countries in, in Europe, they have imported cases, people that have traveled from endemic areas to, their, to those countries, and in the time, they develop cystic echinococcosis. So why do, do we still have these parasites in our countries? Well, there, there could be many, several uh, factors. Uh, one of the, the things that happens here in Peru, and I'm sure um, could happen in, in countries where probably you live, is this kind of uh, ferias, livestock ferias, where they sell and they, they buy and they also slaughter animals and they sell the products there without too much control. Like uh, the, 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 this concept, um, traditional food markets with live animals or, or products from, from those animals. This is very common in, here in, in, in Peru still, uh, not only, particularly in, in the highlands, but not only that. There are other kind of this similar conference. markets. Sorry? I'm okay, Randa? Uh, yes, yes, Professor. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. A few more minutes and I think I'm, going, I'm done. This is a community, for instance, uh, in, in, the, in the highlands. So you see the mountains, you see how people live in these kind of uh, houses, uh, isolated. There's no road, there's no electricity, there's no uh, sewage, there's no tap water, as you can imagine. Here, I, I, I show you this picture because here in, the, in this uh, red cycle, you can see the life cycle of the parasite, the one that I already explained to you, but nobody understood. This is a, like a, the, a small health center in, in these rural communities. They have a, this drawing, nice drawing in the wall, but nobody under, understood that. I was asking people and nobody could explain what, what is here. Um, that means that it's not enough to to try trying to control the disease, diseases like this. Just making some propaganda is, is not enough. There, there we need to to, to use more um, more strategies or strategies that really can be applied and really can have an, an effect in controlling or preventing these uh, zoonotic parasites. The same images that you, the same picture you you saw you saw saw before. Again, this is very very common to see families uh, having a group of of sheep with always with with dogs two three four five and a person taking care of, of of the animals and also like this people in the in these communities they they don't use uh slaughter official slaughter houses as the one that probably as a veterinarians we we know they they kill the animals in the backyard uh, sometimes because they need to to eat something there or they're celebrating they have a party or when they have when they need some some money they they kill the animal and they sell the meat or whatever and you can see around uh, two dogs that probably they are eating the the, the blood, but also the, the, the viscera if this is already infected and even cut. But fortunately, the, the life cycle of Echinococcus granulosa doesn't go through through cats, through domestic cats. 
again another another picture here where people just pick up a place in, in near to a small river to use the water and they slaughter the animals like like here this is in the south uh, another let's call it uh, in, I don't want to use illegal, but this is an informal abattoir uh, in the South Highlands here in Peru, in Puno, where they they slaughter sheep, alpacas, and llamas. As you see, there is no there is no wall, so there is a free access for for dogs that are roaming always. They are roaming around trying to get some some food for them. Again, another another picture of this uh, informal. Uh, slaughterhouses and also this traditional food market where they can someone anyone can go there and, and purchase whatever they want from from these animals and also this uh, this custom this habit uh, in some communities when they when an animal is is dead they just threw away the dead body in, in some areas, uh, but there's not, I mean, there's a free access for these uh, roaming dogs. And they go directly, very interesting, because I was I was expecting that the dogs eat the the legs or the muscle first, but it's not. It's, it's like, as, as I said before, it's like the parasite already understood how to survive in, the, in these conditions, because dogs go first to the abdomen and they eat the liver and the lung first, and then they eat the muscle. So it's exactly what the parasite needs to, to continue the, the life cycle. Another picture of the same. And finally, uh, I have another question for you. Are Echinococcus granulosus eggs present in our food? Yes, the answer is yes. So if you are, I'm sorry, I don't want to be um, <laughs> digesting with this, what, what I'm going to say, but if you want to eat something like this in countries um, where we have this kind of parasite, you have to be sure that it's very, very clean. Because there are some reports, let me put it in big here. There are several actually reports. This is a report of finding Echinococcus granulosus X um, by PCR in in food vegetables and fruit that were uh, were distinct for 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 animals for gorillas but let me go to the next one this is another study let me show you here this is another study in switzerland a uh, very interesting uh, research that uh, were done by a group of um, from dr peter de Plasses. They collected lettuces from lettuce from from the markets, and they were studying what kind of uh, what kind of parasites could be present in these lettuce, and using PCR of course. And what they found among the other parasites that you can see in this in this picture, they found a kind of coccus multilocularis in two samples, and this is in a developed nation. They, they have, because the life cycle is different, Echinococcus multilocularis, they have foxes. So probably foxes are contaminating the, the vegetables that they are consuming in the markets. One more, talking about the contamination of food. This is a, a review, a meta-analysis, and you can see here in Iran, there is also Echinococcus granulosus. I don't remember here in this, in this paper, if they collected sample from the environment or from from vegetables, the same in uh, in Nigeria. Let me go go down. Let me go down. I know this is very small. This is why I'm trying to enlarge here. Also in Turkey, a kind of focus uh, detected in this uh, country. Saudi Arabia, a very interesting uh, study in Libya because they collected uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, again, lettuce, and, and crisps. Chris. And they found eggs of uh, different tinias, but particularly Echinococcus SPP. So 
it is clear you you, you may you may ask me uh, where is Peru in this list of countries Iran Iran Nigeria Turkey Pakistan where is Peru here where Peru is not still in the list because we haven't studied uh, vegetables or water looking for a kind of granulosus sex but probably after after these experiences in different countries even Switzerland Switzerland we are planning to to do this study hopefully soon in the central highlands collecting different vegetables there is a process for collecting the the material of course and doing the PCR and uh, maybe in, in the next year we we will increase our list of countries with um with eggs of Echinococcus granulosus. I'm going to skip this because it's almost the same. And the other question could be this one. Is there any other vector that we can get the, the infection uh, with eggs of Echinococcus granulosus? This is a pretty old um, question, really. But still, Michael Gemmel, uh, a researcher that already did many, many years ago. And the answer in this uh, for this question is, again, is yes. But recently, let me enlarge again this one. You can see here, Coleopteras and Dipteras, uh, flies, or dung beetles, or ground beetles, that are carrying uh, eggs of Echinococcus multilocularis, as you can see here, or Echinococcus granulosus sensulato, or Echinococcus acidetum. So not only uh, we can get the infection through directly by touching the dogs and not washing the hands and eating something or because the dogs lick me or because i eat a, a salad with lettuce tomatoes or everything and was already contaminated but also uh, through different mechanical vectors carriers that can transport the eggs or the parasite to different to different places so I guess I'm finishing with this uh, picture of a, a salad and also a few pictures from, from Peru, llamas in the, in the highlands. This is part of our, our country, making a kind of propaganda for you if you want to visit here. I don't want to scare you, so come, come on, visit Peru, visit uh, places like this. Eat very, very good, and hopefully to see you here in Machu Picchu. Thank you, Randa. Thank you, Professor Caesar. Thank you for the nice photos, as usual. Actually, after Dr. Bilal, I was encouraged to eat meat. After your presentation, no more meat in my life. <laughs> no, 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 that so, was not my intention. Sorry. Yeah, so but you, you had no, some good, nice photos for, for, for delicious uh, plates from your country. So, <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome to come. So. Yes, I'm coming. It's expensive now. Um, yeah. Not really. Well, <laughs> probably the ticket, the airfare, but here in Peru it's not expensive. You come, you you have my house for hosting you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Professor. So, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, there is a few questions to Professor Caesar. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can stay with us till the end of the present, uh, till the end of the webinar. Or are you going to leave? Um, I, I can stay. I can try to stay, uh, Randa. Great, because so, there's some few questions for you. Um, actually, it was an awesome presentation. At the beginning of our webinar, we have a, a, a covered the part of the food safety and food supply chain. Uh, with Dr. Caesar, we have uh, food culture, food safety, food supply chain from, from for the uh, first uh, uh, presentation. The second presentation with Professor Caesar, we have covered one of the most important uh, zoonotic parasite uh, and how it's related to our food culture and food safety. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. And now it's turn to Sadek Sorogio. Uh, so please, Dr. Sadek, I'd like to ask you to present your presentation, to share your presentation, and the floor is yours right now. Thank you, dear. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rada, uh, Randa. So good morning. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. 
I would like to start by thanking this organization for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation is this very important day, which is World, World Food Safety Day 2023. So I am happy to be part of this uh, part of this celebration. I would also like to make a presentation on the uh, how to improve our food safety through one health approach. So Dr. Renda, I think you help me share my presentation here because I'm not familiar with this uh, platform. Please help me share the my presentation. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you if you can sh you can share your screen, doctor? Yes, I can share, but if you can direct me on how to share it, then I will share it myself. Okay, because I can't share my screen, but there is a button in front of the camera. There is X yes. for leave, and then there is share. There is something look like a screen or play YouTube screen yes. look like. Yeah, please. Can you please just okay, share. Uh, yes, click, the click key, on it. And, key, yes. Yeah, and then share then your full screen. The, okay, I should click on share full screen. Yes, not documents, uh, full screen. After that, I I once we can see your screen, I'm going to inform you, okay? Okay, so now I am on the sharing my entire screen. So how will I choose the document? Uh, okay. Can you please open the document in your in your desktop so we can see your. Okay, so okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me, okay, let me try doing that. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to ask the attendee, please, uh, can you please just fill the form? Uh, also, uh, in order to the form of attendance, we have shared it in our chat box. I'm going to share it one more time. Also, we have shared our uh, link, uh, link tree uh, for our uh, One Health Food Safety, Food Security Small Working Group, uh, social media, as well as the web page. Uh, also, we'd like to, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you yeah, see great. my screen now? Yes, we okay. can see it. Yes. Uh, also, we'd like to inform the attendee that the presentation is recorded, and we're gonna share our uh, the recording later. Uh, and also, we will upload it in our YouTube channel. Uh, now we can see it. Uh, please, Doctor Sadak, feel free. The floor is yours. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you once again. So as I said, my presentation will be on improving food safety through One Health approach. And uh, we all know that One Health is a collaboration. It's a, rela it's, it's a synergy between human health sector, animal health sector, and environmental sector to tackle health issues that affect these sectors. So these sectors could be, as I said earlier, could be human sector, animal sector, and then the environmental sector. And this issue include food safety, food security, zoonosis, antimicrobial resistance, environmental health, and so on and so forth. We can see all these issues that I mentioned are related and they can be affected or they can be settled or they can be corrected using one health approach. Then food safety, as we all know, it's all about handling, safe handling, storage and preparation of food to prevent infection and help to make sure that our food gives enough nutrient for us to have a healthy diet. We all know that we cannot survive without good food, without nutritious food, without water, and all this must be safe if we really want us to solve, if we really want to survive. Then Access to sufficient amount of safe and nutritious is key to sustaining life and promoting good health. So here, here we are talking about access to a quality and safe food. When when we have good when, when we have access to safe food, definitely the nutrition content of that food will be high, and our our life will be promoted, and our our, our good health will be also be promoted. But on safe food that contain harmful bacteria, virus, parasites, or chemicals causes more than 200 diseases 
ranging from diarrhea to cancer. So based from, from this point, we see that consuming unsafe food can cause a lot of diseases ranging from diarrhea to cancer. So we can see that consuming unsafe food is a very dangerous to our health. Therefore, it is very important to make sure that our food is safe all the time. Then it also creates a vicious cycle of diseases and malnutrition, particularly affecting infants, young, young children, early and sick. So when we are consuming unsafe food, definitely the harmful organism that that unsafe food contain definitely will affect our immune system and it will cause a lot of trouble to our health. So a good collaboration between human health sector, animal health sector, and the environmental sector is needed to help ensure food safety and stronger food system. Therefore, if we want to make sure that our food is always safe for consumption, our food is safe all the time, we must have a collaboration between human health sector, animal health sector, and the environmental sector to make sure that our communities the entire globe have would have have access to safe food. Then ensuring food safety through one health. So how can we ensure food safety through one health? So we can ensure food safety through this uh, step number one, through good environmental practices. When we say environmental practices, we all know that human health and animal health are interdependent, and at the same time, both depend on the environment. So therefore environment play a very vital role in food safety. Our good environmental practices promote food safety, while for environmental practice definitely causes setback to our food safety. So practices like uh, excess use of chemical fertilizers, improper disposal of plastic material, use in agriculture, livestock production, fishing, and aquaculture are major drivers of water and soil pollution. And the discharges of discharge of the pollution into our environment is not only a great concern for the ecosystem health, but also for human health. So now, when we are using uh, excess uh, chemical fertilizers, excess uh, pesticides in our farms, so definitely when there is wrongful, that fertilizer, that chemicals, that pesticide will be washed away to our rivers. And some of our farmers will use that, uh, that water to irrigate their vegetables that will be taken to our markets for sale. And even some of our uh, farmers would take their, their animals, livestock, to the riverside to drink water. And in the process, they would defecate in the river, thereby passing some pieces of, uh, some eggs of parasites in their pieces. And our farmers, Will you will use that water to irrigate their their farms, their vegetables, and their and this vegetable we end up in our farms. And we know that this water that we are using, our farmers when they irrigate their 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 gardens, or I can say their vegetable with it, definitely there must be some eggs of the parasite that will stick to that to that vegetables. There are some uh eggs or some uh, diseases like salmonellosis, campylobacter, escherichia coli, which are the common food, food uh, diseases that which are common food, food diseases that can be that can be transferred when you consume all this food. So therefore, therefore, if you want to make sure that this thing, this water is protected, we must reduce the use of chemicals, the use of pesticides in our farm. Or we make sure that we devise, we devise a means that will protect our rivers from being damaged or from being affected by all these chemicals. There also, when we come to the number two, through animal health, we know that uh, our animals serve as a source of food, especially uh, the nutrient content, meat, eggs that we used to get from our animals. So, but getting these uh, food from animal, this animal, the health of this animal is supposed to be protected. Animals serve as a source of nutrient. Therefore, if you want to make sure that this nutrient, this food that we are getting from this animal is, is safe, we should subject our animals 
especially foot animal to anti-motor examination and for motor examination. What I mean by anti-motor examination is the examination before slaughter. We make sure we make we screen the healthy animals from the sick animal before slaughtering. And then after slaughtering, we also conduct post-mortem examination to get rid of some uh, diseases like uh, tuberculosis, anthrax, uh, some parasitic diseases like uh, tenia saginata, uh, tenia solium. All, all these things can cause harmful effect to a human being. Then through good food handling by human. So when, we, when our animals are slaughtered, or when the vegetables are taken from our farms, to our houses from about and meat from about to our houses. So definitely the handling of such food would determine the safety of our of our food. Some people you will see that they are they are using any they, they are handling their their food, processing it, processing it anyhow without a proper handling. So this is these are the steps that we can take to make sure that our food at our homes are safe for consumption. Number one, keep clean. We should make sure that our food are always clean. When we brought the vegetables from the market, we will wash them. So normally, we used to wash them with a little amount of salt to get rid of all these uh, parasitic eggs, all these uh, estrechia coli and other diseases. Then when we keep it clean, Definitely, it's a step forward to for safety. Then number two, separate raw and cooked food. You know, when when your food uh, are raw, you should not you should not uh, match them with the cooked one. What I mean here is that, for instance, a meat. When you brought a meat, you should make sure that you separate it from the cooked one, so that to avoid what we call cross contamination. That's the contamination from one object to another. So this is normally common in our kitchen. You see that our people will handle meat and cook raw meat and then go go ahead and grab vegetables that already that they have washed and start using it. So definitely we are encouraging what is called cross contamination. Then keep food at safe temperature. So you know there are certain food when we cook food that we pre, that we preserve at certain temperature to avoid contamination. So so as when we when we will use it again, the food will remain safe for consumption. Then use safe water and raw materials. So what I mean by safe water is that clean water, a clean water that is not contaminated by any chemicals like that uh, of these uh, uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. We should use clean water in cooking our food. We know that there are a lot of uh, disease that are uh, waterborne disease, even cholera and some of the uh, uh, estrechia coli, they are also foodborne and then uh, waterborne disease at the center. So we we'll make sure that we use all this clean water in preferring our food. So I think I will, uh, I will stop here till next time. Happy World Food Safety Day. Thank you for listening. Bye. Hello. Hello? 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. Dr. Okay. Randa, where are you? Dr. Randa? Dr. Randa may be experiencing her own internet challenges. I'm Dr. Stroud. I'm with the One Health Commission, and I've been uh, helping her host this webinar. Um, I know she was hoping to introduce me, but uh, since it seems that she's having internet problems right now, perhaps we can go to the questions. Let's see in the chat Hello, box. My presentation. Hello, hope you yes, we enjoyed, we enjoyed all your presentations. They were excellent. I know that we had a few questions in the chat box. I'll try to bring them forward and hopefully Randa will rejoin us. So one question, um, this I think was during the 
first or second presentation, the question is, is infection with salmonella more common than pasteurella in food for those dealing with the food factories? So is salmonella more common than pasteurella? Any of you speakers can address that? Uh, well, I, I I don't work with uh, with bacteria like Salmonella and Pasteurella, so I'm afraid I I won't be able to to answer that important question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer either. Um, Dr. Sadiq, do you have any impression? Uh, please, uh, pardon, repeat the question. Um, which is more common in food contamination, Salmonella or Pasteurella? I think uh, based on the uh, cases that we are we are seeing here, Salmonella is more common in this part of uh, Nigeria where I am. But I, do, I don't know the other part of the country. But in the northern part of Nigeria, Salmonella is very common. Thank you. Another question that came forward, is there any rapid test like a SNAP test or a PCR test for Echinococcus that could be used in um, llama populations? Yeah, I, I guess that question for me. Um, if you, if someone wants to detect the larval stage, there we have serology, but serology is not specific. I mean, there's, there could be animals that are seropositive without the, the infection, without cysts, because the serology measures only the antibodies and the contact with uh, with the with the eggs, and not all the eggs are able to to become cyst. Uh, if the question goes through for well, it says in llama, so llama is the intermediate host. The other way to detect the parasite is just in the slaughterhouses when they go to the abattoir at the necropsy. Uh, just for research, for investigation, some researchers are having used and still use uh, ultrasound, looking for cysts in the in livers. But again, it's just for for standardizing other things or looking for prevalences in animals. Uh, ultrasound is is um, is the tool that is very helpful for the diagnosis in in humans and also in animals. Although for those who perform ultrasound in animals, you want to, to see the whole liver, it's kind of difficult, I, under, I understand that, because of the position of the liver with all the, with all the viscera around, all the organs around, it's not the same as uh, like in humans. In humans, it's very easy to see the whole liver. Um, PCR or SNAP for detecting cysts in llama or in general in intermediate hosts, Again, it's only used for, there's a PCR, but it's only used for um, for research. It's not a, a common test. I don't know if I answer, if I cover the, the curiosity of that uh, friend, Mauricio. Thank you so much, Dr. Cesar. I see Rhonda that you're back. We lost you for a moment. So I stepped in to start the questions. Um, would you like to take over from here? There, There is a question. Um, in the chat box about what the speakers think about the tendency to convert worms and insects as a source of food. Worms? Oh, I can see it. Um, that's, a, that's a very <laughs> nice question, important ones, because yeah, it's not only for for humans, but also for animals. If I, I, I remember I have read some some research on that. But my question would be transforming um, or converting worms and insects into food or flour. I don't know if in the process we will be able to destroy the eggs of different parasites. Or I don't know. I, I guess, I, I'm just guessing, I, I guess we could have some eggs surviving all the process, but I'm not sure because I, I don't know exactly what temperatures or what processes they use to transform the, the worms and, and insects. I don't know exactly. That's an important could, question, by the way. It is an important question. If I could just make a comment, this to me 
is a prime example of how important the One Health approach is because we need the entomologist, the people who know yes. about insects and their parasites, we need them in the conversation about food safety. Yes. And in our siloed systems, we don't always have all the information because we don't always have the right people at the table. So uh, it is a very important question. And as more food sources move toward insect, um, we'll need those entomologists highly involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. Randa, you. over to you. Uh, I, I will check if there's any more questions. Uh, I guess that there's some questions Dr. Professor Caesar has answered in the chat. Uh, because it was written in Spanish. Gracias, Estemote. Is that correct? But before anything, I'd like to introduce our team leader uh, from One Health Commission, Professor Shirel. Uh, thank you so much for hosting our presentation today, our webinar today. Uh, you are an awesome lady. Thank you so much. I don't know how I don't have any further words to share with you so i'm so i'm glad for 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 that you are today part of our webinar um uh, also uh, i'd like to ask if there's any questions from the attendee you can just drop them down in our chat box if nobody uh, or you can just unmute yourself and ask them directly to our speaker before closing our webinar oh yeah there's one can I read it? Okay. Do you want me to read it, Professor? As Go ahead a, and read, a it read it for everyone, Randa, please. Yeah, thank you. As a qualified professional, uh, what will your imp implementation will, uh, be in order to reduce pathogens in communities that have higher risks? And how do people from rural areas protect their rivers and get the water as a source of drinking? Again, uh, if you allow me to, to try to answer a little bit of this question, very important okay. questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so trying to implement something that in order to reduce, I mean, control measures, control strategies will work as long as, that's, that's my impression, will work as long as people uh, get involved in what they are doing. What, what I mean is, I know that um, uh, eating raw viscera, dogs eating raw viscera with the seas will close the life cycle. And I can go there to the communities and say, okay, don't, don't do this. Try to bury the, or try to burn or try to boil the, the viscera. But this is my knowledge. It's not their knowledge. And they won't, they won't do it. Or probably they, they will do it just for a, a short period of time because they exactly they don't understand what is the purpose of boiling or bury the, the viscera. And Normally, when we try to implement control strategies, they go to the communities with our knowledge of the infectious diseases and try to impose what they we understand, but they don't understand, and they have another kind of life. What I mean in general is that we need to go, as I said before, we need a, an entomologist. So but for this kind of diseases, with these uh, sociologists, we, we need anthropologists that people to that better understand the, their belief, their habits, their lifestyle, and they have the, the impression of the what the, the perception of the diseases in, in their animals and also the, the diseases on them. And as long as we, we can involve people uh, from the communities in their decisions on what to do, and we are going to be successful. Otherwise, it's going to take years and years and decades. There are countries for cystic echinococcus that have take, they have taken like up 60 or 70 years to control the disease. And here in South America, 
Brazil, not Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, particularly those countries that are successful in their programs, they're having, they having now more than 50 years working to, together to control the disease. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time. So we have to do other, other things besides our knowledge and our, uh, our trying to impose the not to do or what to do, like uh, washing your hands. Okay, but washing your hands for them, they don't have water for washing their hands. They don't have soap for washing their hands. So how can we ask people in these poor communities to, to find water and to find soap for washing, for washing their hands? Um, maybe that we can, <laughs> we can discuss about that, but I think we have to understand this uh, behavior of the people in, in rural communities. They are not our partner here. It's, it's not. Mm, okay, I, I will stop there. Okay. Okay. Let me. Okay. Let me. Let me add something to what uh, Professor Caesar just said. Uh, actually, for the communities that are using rivers as a source of water, what we normally do is that we used to advise them to divide the river into three: the upper part of the river for drinking the middle part of the river for their washing and other activities, and the last part of the detail of the river for disposing their refills. So that that will will not that will prevent contamination of the water by other pathogens. Also, uh, unnecessary disposal of refills in the in the river should be should be avoided, and the animals should have their point of drinking water. So that they will, need, they will not be drinking water at any part of the river to avoid contamination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Professor Siza and Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sadek. So we can conclude that the core of One Health is health equity, and health is for everybody, not only for 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 special for special people. So I'd like to uh, to ask from to, to sorry from what's his, from Doctor Tomello Faith, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Then we will move to Doctor Zahra question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the answer to my question, and I actually wrote another question here. Uh, about pathogens is that how have you guys uh, developed strategies of uh, how to stop the life cycle of these pathogens that are destroying the lives of people in the rural communities? Oh, I can, I can repeat, so, so, sorry, I can repeat the question. I said that have you developed strategies of how to stop the life cycle of the pathogens that are destroying the lives of the people in the rural communities. Yes, I mean you are you meant cyanococcus uh, granulosus, cystic cyanococcus. Yes. Yes. Some... For cyanococcus granulosus, for example, like do you have yes. a strategy of how to prevent the the larvae to get into the dogs or the sheep just to yes. stop the life cycle yeah sure uh, we we already know in people that works with the parasite we already know many different strategies one is uh, controlling uh, the disease by by cutting the the life cycle in the definitive host mean uh, i mean dogs the prasiquantel i'm not selling prasiquantel yes for, but prasiquantel is an excellent drug, a hundred percent efficacious drug. Just one one dose of prasiquantel in dogs, you kill all the parasites. You don't kill, you don't destroy the eggs. So for some time, you will find eggs probably in the environment. If you think in the intermediate host, uh, ten or fifteen years ago, a researcher in Australia, Marshall Light Towers discover um, a recombinant protein called EG95, which in the time has become used as a, as a pilot control programs in China, 
Chile, Argentina, and we use it for five years as a donation here in Peru. Uh, the, re the preliminary results in those areas show that the, the vaccine is working. The problem with the vaccine in, in sheep is uh, how, how to handle under this rural and very uh, uh, distance communities. Uh, sometimes you you can you can schedule the vaccination for for the animals, but people don't want the vaccine, or people just go far away from from the point of the vaccination, and or they don't have enough number of lambs for the vaccination, etc. There's some logistic logistic problems with the vaccine, but the vaccine works. Yes, it works, but the problem is how to how to put it for a, in a in a big scale in these endemic areas. Education is another strategy, as always, uh, education is everywhere, but only education take, will take an estimation of 100, more than 50 years, like 100 years. Um, there's another strategy, which is uh, an early, early detection of, um, of, uh, of humans already infected with SIS, means um, children in the school, in school age. This is what people are, are using in Argentina and China and Chile. They make ultrasound in those kids and they take uh, a very early stages of the of the parasite. Uh, also, we we were working with a chemotherapy using a drug a drug that is very close to albendazole, which is oxfendazole. It's, it's an, a very old antiparasitic drug for animals. But, and we tested for in, in sheep, and it's working. I mean, it's not a hundred percent efficacious drug, but kills at least between fifty percent and seventy percent of the protest colleges in the in the in the seas, either in lungs or, or liver. So we are not disappearing the parasite, but we are reducing the risk of infection for dogs. I mean, if the dogs eat a seas containing a thousand proteoscolesis, normally with uh, the treatment in sheep, we reduce it to 500 or 400 seeds or 400 proteoscolesis. So as you can see, there are many, many strategies around, around the, the parasite that we already know. The problem is how to implement it and maintaining for a long time. This, this is the, the question that we are working on that. In Peru, we had a pilot control program for, for five years and we are working on the results with the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Health and the University, of course. And let's see what, what happened with the, with the result, because it's very easy to put a, a nice protocol for controlling the disease in a Word document, but then it's very hard to, to carry the, the program in, in the field with other difficulties. Thank you. Nice, nice question. Okay, let me add to- Thank you, Dr. Caesar. Okay, let me add to what the prof just said. Uh, actually, there are a simple way that you can break this uh, life cycle of all these parasites, especially those that are zoonotic. And, 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 and these two steps are dooming the animal. Once you do warm the animal, definitely you break the life cycle. And then number two, dooming the human women can also take the woman so that they will stop passing the eggs in their pieces so that maybe when they duplicate, uh, open, use the open duplication, definitely the eggs will not be washed away to our nearby rivers or will not be, uh, will not affect our animals. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Caesar and Dr. Sadek for the clarification. Uh, Dr. Bilal, also feel free if you want to add anything. Uh, now, uh, we will move on to Dr. Zahra question. Thank you so much, Dr. Zahra, for your question. Um, uh, Faith, do you have any further questions? No, I don't have any questions at the moment, but thank you so much. Thank you, dear. Uh, we will share the email of the speakers, so if you want to uh, ask them any question, you can email them directly. So okay. now we will move on. To Thank you, dear. Now we will move on to Dr. Zahra's question. Uh, Dr. Caesar, you said 
uh, echinococcus granulosus is present in case A. Even he mentioned that it's also in Libya. If we want to compare it uh, with the other countries, since case A, Jordan even, and Libya are added countries. Um, I don't know about the situation in Egypt, where he, she's asking uh, where she can find it in case A. In case A, yeah. I, I already put a message here. Uh, I found that report of the that I, I presented to you. Um, I put the, the article there. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis. Um, I don't remember if this is a meta-analysis or a review, but a systematic review. Okay, I already read it. This is a systematic review with the Research, research looking for eggs in different countries, in different uh, different publications. So I just took that information. Uh, I, I hope that information is true. So I don't know exactly where in KSA uh, you could find a kind of uh, She's asking, uh, is she means that I find it in lettuce or tomato, as you said. So she's Sorry? asking the... Yes, where she can find it, and lettuce and tomatoes, for example. <laughs> yes. Uh, what? What? Ah, okay. I I, I mean, could I find yeah. it in lettuce or tomatoes? Yes, yes. Uh, apparently, that that report of uh, in Libya, they I, I didn't read the the whole paper in Libya. I just took the information from the systematic review. But for instance, I, I know that they work in Switzerland. What they do, what they did is collecting lettuce in a plastic bag, very easy, I mean, apparently easy. Uh, they collect it in a plastic bag with water. So they, they wash it and pass it for the first um, screen, the first filter. And then they, they collected the second one, they pass that, that water for the second one and the third one. They made like a three different filtrations. And the last one, the pellet from the last one, centrifugation and this kind of uh, uh, techniques in the lab, they do, they did a PCR, and they found in that lettuce, in those, those vegetables, they found eggs from a kind of focus uh, granulosus. So this is what we are planning to do here in the in the Central Highlands, collecting different vegetables, probably lettuce, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, or whatever, and just follow the steps like a recipe you know probably I, I don't work in the lab but probably people that work in the lab may understand better than me but what they did is filtration like a three different step of filtration until obtaining the the eggs of the parasites and passing through through pcr so uh, thank you so much professor caesar for your answer um Actually, it's time for us to end our meet our webinar for today. I'd like to ask the audience, uh, please, just uh, uh, yeah, you're welcome, Zahra. Um, and also, I'd like to just to add something. So, thank you so much, Professor Marcella, for your uh, conclusion. Uh, conclu conclusion. It's time for us to um, uh, uh, to show that how much important the One Health approach. Um, as she mentioned in the chat box. Uh, before ending our meeting, uh, we would like to thank everybody who had attended today, our superstar, Professor Cesar, uh, and also our our superstars, Dr. Bilal and Dr. Sadat. Thank you so much for presenting your nice presentation about food culture and food safety. Uh, happy Food Safety Day for everybody. Uh, also, um, uh, yes, Dr. Bila, if you want to add something before we close our webinar. No, I'd like to thank you. It's, it's a very uh, honor for me to, to be with you today. And it's, it's not so Yeah, also, it's our honor to have you with us today. Um, and please uh, follow our social media pages to know more about our projects, to know more about One Health uh, Social Sciences uh, Small Working Group. We are one of them, Food Safety and Food Security. Um, I'd like also to thank our our team member who attended today, Michael, Professor Marcella, and for sure, Dr. C Professor Caesar. Again, and our superstar, Dr. Professor uh, 
natural. Thank you so much. We will share an email with the speakers uh, details in case you want to contact them also with their presentation as well as the recording and who had filled the form you're going to receive the certificate of attendance. Again, thank you and have a nice day or a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, Randa, thank you very much again. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye.